Okay, so today uh, we're going to continue on looking at one-way slab design, and there are a few things we're going to look at. Let's see, make sure, uh, it's not quite as visible as I would like. Maybe if I turn these lights down, that might help a bit. Yeah, it's a little too bright, I think. There we go. I think that's a lot better. Okay, so within the topic of one-way slab design, we're going to look at a few things. Uh, we're first going to look at some of our uh, general requirements, general code requirements, that kind of thing. Um, what I want to look at is, uh, let's see, so I do want to look at uh, minimum slab thickness. Uh, minimum slab thickness. I also want to look at, uh, we talked a bit about last time about shrinkage and creep, and I would, I'd like to look at minimum steel for shrinkage and creep. So minimum steel for shrinkage and creep. Uh, and then I want to look at uh, slab analysis and design. And this is going to be one-way slab analysis and design uh, for both uh, a simply supported case and a continuous case. So we have a few things we're going to look at, and uh, I just want to work through these. I want to take a look at some of the code requirements, I want to review some of the theory we looked at last time, and hopefully today, we, we, I, what I really want to do today is actually get some of uh, some uh, quantitative examples of how we can actually calculate some uh, properties, uh, such as MoMA capacity, shear capacity, necessary steel, etc., uh, for uh, slab design. Okay. So first of all, there are a few things you need to consider from the ACI. So uh, regardless, uh, so if you're actually building a uh, reinforced concrete slab, ACI puts certain minimum provisions uh, that you have to follow. So uh, minimum slab thickness. Uh, the minimum slab thickness is the first one I'd, I'd like to look at. And this is found in sections in ACI 7.3.1.1. Isn't this lovely? 7.3.1.1.1 uh, through 7.3.1.1.2. And I'm going to pull, and I would encourage you all to pull up your ACI manual at this time and follow along with me as I go through this. So again, 7.3.1.1. And uh, this details the minimum slab thickness for a one way reinforced concrete slab. So let's go there. So, uh, you'll notice in ACI, uh, for slabs, they use the variable H. And H in this context refers to the slab thickness. H is going to refer to your slab thickness. And uh, the reason for this is that even though it is a thickness, and you, you might think T, for example, you might think of using the variable T for thickness, uh, we're, when, uh, as we saw last time, when we analyze or design reinforced concrete slabs, we're going to be treating them as beams. So there is a mi certain minimum H, a minimum slab thickness H, and we're going to be using the variable H for uh, slab thickness. And this table, depending on the uh, type of supports you have, um, whether it's simply supported, 
For simply supported, there's a requirement for L over 20. Uh, for 1n continuous, 2n continuous, etc. Now, as in terms of what these mean, a simply supported slab would be one that is simply resting on supports. So if you have columns like this, not rigidly joined together, the slab is simply resting on the supports, that would be a simply supported slab. Uh, something that is continuous on one side, Continuous in this context refers to a slab that continues past a supporting beam or column. So if you have something, uh, imagine you have something like this, a slab that is simply supported on one side, but on the other side, it continues over a support. Something like this. Maybe there's a beam that is, that is cast into. So you have not one, but two, uh, but two spans in this case. This would be an example of a slab that is continuous on one side. And here they have a, uh, a minimum thickness of L over 24. And then also there's uh, both, end, both ends continuous, which would just be basically this on both ends. And the limit there is L over 28. And a uh, cantilever, which would just be an overhanging slab, that is L over 10. And so again, both ends uh, continuous would be if you have a slab that is integrally, integrally cast into beams on both sides of it. And a cantilever slab would be one that is supported with a rigid support on one end and is just dangling out in the air. And so uh, you can kind of see a order of precedence or an order of seriousness here. So keep in mind, this is a minimum slab thickness. So the higher the number, the, the, high, the, fi the higher the final H value, the thicker your slab is going to need to be, the stronger your slab is going to need to be, all, all, all other things being equal. And so um, uh, since these are all defined as ratios of L, where L is the length of the span, L here is the span length, The larger the number in the denominator here, the less stringent that requirement. So you can see that being continuous actually helps you quite a bit on a minimum slab requirement. And the whole idea of this, well, now the provisions here, they have, uh, there's a lot that actually goes into these numbers. There's a lot uh, of um, mechanics, deflection limits, and some other things. But this basically says, I don't care, this requirement basically says, look, I don't care what your math says in regards to what you need mechanically. Uh, if I don't care if it's uh, your math tells you that you can get away with a one inch thick slab, we're not going to let you use that. That's not safe. Uh, that is not very constructible. Uh, constructible meaning that, that it can actually be built safely without, you know, uh, in real world construction conditions, etc. And so those and so concerns of mechanics, deflection, uh, and really just redundancy and uh, constructability are what guide a lot of these uh, requirements. Uh, so that's minimum slab thickness again. These are requirements that apply anytime you're designing a reinforced concrete slab uh, or one-way reinforced concrete slab, and you perform these checks either first or after. Uh, you can perform these checks either for, before or after doing your uh, actual mechanics calculations, but the key is that regardless of what the, your mechanics say you need in terms of strength, you still have certain minimum code values for your minimum slab thickness. Okay, questions on minimum slab thickness. Hopefully this is fairly straightforward. Okay, and if at any point you can't see what I'm writing, uh, please let me know. At least in a classroom setting, I can uh, look to look at y'all's uh, faces and see looks of confusion and things if I'm uh, not writing very clearly or I'm writing behind a uh, the podium or something. So, but of course, in this forum, in this uh, particular format, that isn't as doable don't get quite the same amount of feedback I do in the in-person setting, and even that I'm not perfect at, as you uh, know all too well. Okay. So we have our minimum slab thickness, and there are some other code-related requirements. Uh, let's see. 
so and also there are uh, one other thing I would mention that there are on 7.3.1.1 and 7.3.1.2 there's one other thing I wanted to mention on this let me go back there uh these requirements are for if you look in the provision if you look at not the table 7.3.1.1 but actually the language below that, uh, seven, just, uh, seven, just uh, provision 7.3.1.1.1, uh, you'll see a little statement that says for FY other than 60,000 PSI, uh, the expressions in this table shall be multiplied by 0.4 plus FY over 100,000. This is basically saying that these provisions are assuming 60 KSI steel. If you're using some other type of steel, you do need to apply a small multiplier to, multi to, to adjust these uh, table, table values accordingly. Okay, so, or in other words, if that's not clear, uh, let's say if you had a, if you had a simply supported slab, and let's say you have a simply supported slab, and its length. Now, be very careful that, that you're not confusing L and LN. L is used in, the, in these equations. LN is something different that we've mentioned before. LN is your clear span, your column to column or beam to beam span. While L is the actual overall length of the slab. And then you have H here. So for a simply supported slab, uh, and let's say, uh, let's say L is 20 feet. Well, our minimum, oh, and let's say L is 20 feet and our yield stress is, let's go ahead and use something different than what they propose, what, what the standard one is. Let's go ahead and say, oh, let's say the yield stress is 50 KSI. So we're using an unusual steel as well or maybe not the best steel. So let's go ahead and see how we handle these minimum thickness values. So a, um, the first thing we need to do is calculate, get our L. And we already have L, except we do need it in inches rather than in feet. So that would be 20 feet, of course, times 12 inches divided by one foot. And we get 240 inches, hopefully not too bad. Then um, if, since, since we have a simply supported slab, our uh, minimum thickness will be H equals L over 20. So we're actually just going to divide by 20 again. So that's 240 over 20, or that would just come to uh, 12 inches. It's actually quite a uh, decently large slab, or decently thick slab, uh, if I managed to math that uh, correctly, which you never know. Okay, so L over 20. And so you'll notice you'll do, you do take quite a large penalty for the, you do take quite a large penalty for the simply supported slab versus using the uh, continuous on both ends. Okay, so uh, you have that. Then what if, but how do we handle this 50 KSI? What we need to do is we need to multiply by 0.4. Uh, we need to adjust. Because again, this H value, this table assumes 60 KSI steel. So we need to take that same 12 inch thickness and multiply by 0 0.4 plus, and it says FY over 100,000. Something like 100,000 is probably a good clue that you're dealing with uh, uh, a number in PSI rather than KSI. So we want to use our value of FY of 50,000 PSI divided by 100,000. And so that will be 12 inches times, that's gonna come to, uh, let's see, that's over 100,000, so that's 0 0.5, so 0 0.4 plus 0 0.5, that's 0 0.9. So 12 inches times 0 0.9, and what will that come to? Let me fill up my calculator really quick. Although I suppose I could just, uh, well, let's see. 12 times 0 0.1 is 1.2. 12 times 1.2 is 10.8. So that would be 10.8 inches is our minimum slab thickness. And 
And the key to remember here with minimum slab thickness is that this is what we refer to as a prescriptive provision. Now, in design codes, a if you're not familiar with the term, a prescriptive provision is one that, regardless of what the principles tell you, the basic, uh, regardless of what your mathematics tell you, um, in other words, let me, maybe I'll go ahead and write this out a little bit just to be cl very clear. So again, min slab thickness this is an example of a prescriptive provision. It's prescriptive. It is prescribed. It is required. In other words, what it's saying is uh, all of your math, all of your um, all of your math looking at m ultimate, you know, phi m n, All the math that you do to determine your area of steel, et cetera, all the math and all that basic mechanics and all the mechanics that we've explored so far, um, that is going to be necessary. You're going to need to apply all of that. Um, but based on that, you'll calculate, you'll, you'll end up with some H required. However, the code says check that uh, your H is at least the H min. The minimum H. So in other words, if our, depending on what, now we don't know what kinds of loads are on this slab, but let's say this, but uh, let's say based on all of our, our mechanics, uh, if we determined in this example that our minimum slab thickness was, or our required slab thickness was, I don't know, nine inches. If that were the case, we wouldn't be able to use that. We would have to use a 10.8 inches. Uh, it is a prescriptive value. It doesn't matter what loads or uh, it doesn't matter what kind of loads or what kind of uh, materials you have. Uh, at the end of the day, the, regardless of what your mechanics say, you have a certain minimum slab thickness. That is an example of a code prescriptive requirement. Okay, any questions on slab thickness? Hopefully this is fairly straightforward, uh, but I do think it's a, it's a nice uh, opportunity to illustrate the idea of prescriptive code requirements. Any questions? Okay, so again, hopefully fairly straightforward. And I'm not going to explore each of these prescriptive requirements to the same depth, but I do want to just illustrate how these work uh, in terms of the interaction of mechanics and code. So uh, my, our ne the next thing I want to look at is, uh, let's look at the cover requirements. And this isn't going to be too different than um, what we've seen before. Uh, so we do have cover requirements. And this co minimum cover is going to be uh, applied very similarly to what we've done with beams. And minimum cover, the minimum cover requirements will be found in table uh, 20.5. Point one, point three, point one. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Twenty point five point uh, one point three point one. So if you could open up your ACI and take a look at that. Twenty 
So uh, this doesn't have any. This does not have provisions specifically for uh, concrete uh, slabs, but we can see that basically the exact same provisions for beams apply uh, to slabs. These are cover requirements are the same regardless of the type of element you have. What matters instead is how uh, how that uh, given element is uh, is connected or exposed to the environment, exposed to water primarily, uh, exposed to ground contact, etc. So. Um, for example, if you have uh, some, so if you have a slab, for example, a slab in contact with the ground. Uh, the minimum requirement there is the specified cover is three inches. And as a review for cover, what this means is if you imagine you have, say, the slab of a foundation or the bottom surface of a basement, the bottom slab of a basement, this means that the minimum cover, the distance from the edge of the bar to the edge of the slab, would have to be three inches. Uh, that would be a minimum cover uh, for a slab exposed to the ground or exposed to soil. So we do need to consider minimum cover requirements. Those aren't going to go away. Uh, what, uh, what else? There are some other things we want to look at. So we've got minimum cover requirements. We have, so we have, uh, we have our minimum thickness. We have minimum cover requirements. And next, I want to look at uh, minimum flexural reinforcement. And this does apply. In addition to the limits of uh, minimum steel for shrinkage and creep, which we'll look at, so basically, what I want to do, what I'm doing today, is we're starting with a sort, a sort a, basically a assorted grab bag of uh, prescriptive requirements. And I know this is a bit annoying at times, but that is just the nature of practicing a very regulated field like engineering. It is uh, there are a lot of requirements that you need to be aware of when you're designing a uh, any kind of structure that people are going to live in, work in, inhabit, etc. So uh, we have our uh, minimum flexural reinforcement. Uh, I don't like that. Don't like that at all. Okay, so minimum flexural reinforcement. Minimum flexural reinforcement. Now, this is found in 7.6.1.1. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So if you could pull up your ACI to section 7.6.1.1, and we'll see minimum flexural reinforcement. Seven point six point one point one. Okay, now um, the key to keep in mind is that this is flexural reinforcement. And that has a very specific meaning. So this, when, we, when the ACI says flexural, what they mean is that this is referring to steel that you're adding uh, because or you're or relying on, or I should say relying on, for mechanical strength. For uh, flexural strength. So remember how we talked about last time the difference between one-way slabs and two-way slabs. A one-way slab A one-way slab has major bars going in just one direction. So let's say these are major bars, uh, structure, maybe I could call them structural steel. 
And the other direction, oh, and I should probably show that uh, two-way with a two-way. But then in the, in the one-way slab, we still, have, we still do have steel in the other direction, but it is minor steel just for shrinkage and creep. So, we'll have a, so again, the major bars will be larger and uh, cl more closely spaced, while the minor um, shrinkage and creep steel will be smaller and more widely spaced. So, now in terms of flexural, st uh, in terms of this minimum flexural reinforcement, here it is only to this major structural bars that this flexural reinforcement, minimum flexural reinforcement, will apply. Only uh, to major bars. Or in other words, your minimum uh, flexural reinforcement on a one-way slab, it will apply in just one direction. On a two-way slab, it will apply in both directions. Anytime you're relying on steel to carry, uh, when you're relying on steel for its actual structural mechanical strength, the uh, flexural strength, minimum flexural steel requirements apply. Does that make sense, hopefully? Or any questions on that? So continuing on, so we have that, the minimum flexural reinforcing requirements. Oh, and I should probably actually, let me actually write out that formula. That would be helpful to discuss how this is actually handled. So look at the provisions here, 7.6.1.1. It states that the AS min, the minimum structural reinforcement, is greater than or equal to 0.001 uh, AG. Now, what does this area of steel mean? And what does this area of gross mean, this AG? Okay, so this is AG, is your gross section area. And AS is your area of steel, just what we've looked, similar to what we've looked at before. Or area of flexural reinforcement. Now, how do, we apply, how do we calculate the gross area? For a beam, this is relatively straightforward. A beam has known dimensions. It's just the actual base times height. That's not too bad. So beam, I think that's pretty easy. But with a, uh, with a slab, we have a little diff more difficult problem in that how do we calculate the, area, the gross area if we have this very long slab that might be hundreds of feet wide for, or long in some instances as well. The way we handle that, again, remember we're looking at the, uh, we're going to use a unit beam approach where we cut out a piece of the slab that is one foot wide. So we have a, pe a piece of the slab that is one foot wide and has a thickness of H. And so H, or so area gross in this case for our model beam, uh, our gross area is simply H times our one foot slab width or simply 12 inches. And then you just multiply that by 0 0.0018 or 0.18% and that tells you the minimum area of steel that must occur per foot of beam. Okay, now this again, this does not mean that your steel bars have to be spaced one foot each. You wouldn't want to just lump all the steel together in one place at the middle. In fact, uh, the more bars you, and smaller bars you have, the better generally. 
but um, better just for redundancy's sake. But if uh, so, again, we saw last time that we can transform a equivalent area of steel in a in a one foot wide model beam into an actual steel layout for that will be used in a uh, one way reinforced concrete slab. Okay, so there's that. Uh, that is our minimum uh, flexural reinforcement. Any questions on this? Again, hopefully not too bad. Next thing I want to look at is uh, shrinkage and uh, temperature reinforcement, or shrinkage and creep, depending on how you want to call it. So, or maybe you could call this minor steel, or minimum slash minor steel. Your non-flexural steel. This, again, is steel that is meant to take into account or meant to address not flexural resistance. That helps not with flexural resistance. Well, I suppose it would help a little bit, but, uh, but its intention is to not help with flexural resistance, you know, your actual overall moment capacity. Rather, it is intended to serve as a, uh, to resist shrinkage, creep, uh, thermal expansion, etc. So these various minor, uh, these various minor uh, structural uh, issues, and so you are required to have some steel for that, but it's not uh, something you're going to be performing uh, major flexural uh, moment capacity calculations for. Now, as far as where this is found, this can be found a couple places, well, two places. We have uh, here 24.3, or it's 24.4.3.2. Uh, that is your minimum uh, shear. Uh, sorry, not shear, minimum shrinkage in creep steel. And we also have 24.4. Don't you just love ACI uh, numbering systems? So lovely. 24.4.3.3. Uh, uh, just if, uh, if you, you can just, I always felt you can just open up the ACI and immediately realize this is definitely something that was written by a committee. And in fact, by very many committees over quite a long length of time. Okay, so this is 24.4.3.3. This is your max spacing for this steel. So it, it, uh, let's go to, let's go here, 24.4.3, uh, I suppose. So open up ACI to 24.4. Uh, point three, point two. So we have this minimum area of steel again, and what do you know? It's that same point zero zero one eight requirement. It's that same uh, point zero zero one eight ag. So this requirement is always going to apply. That point one oh oh one eight ag is always almost always going to apply. 
uh, even whether whether your steel is flexural or uh, non-flexural in, in a given direction, but just depending on, um, but in almost all cases, the flexural steel will vastly exceed this requirement. Okay, and then you have a, um, for the uh, shrinkage and temperature, there is a maximum spacing. And this max spacing uh, is going to be, uh, shall not exceed, it says it shall not exceed the lesser of 5H and 18 inches, or the max spacing um, is going to be, and again, this is just for the temperature and shrinkage steel, is the minimum of uh, 5H, five times slab thickness, and 18 inches. So just another code check uh, to take a look at. Okay, just another prescriptive requirement for our code checks. Okay, so again, hopefully this isn't too bad. These are just checks we need to work through. Uh, and ideally after we perform our, well, there's a couple different ways you can approach this. You can treat these code checks as sort of a starting point. For example, if you're designing a reinforced concrete slab, you don't, you know, you're starting with a blank piece of paper, you need to design a slab to, to carry some loads. Uh, if you need to do that, uh, then if you need somewhere to start in terms of a slab thickness, well, it's not a bad, pla it's not a bad place to start, to start with the minimum slab thickness, because you know you're never going to be able to go under there, so really that may not be too bad, at, at too bad a starting point. And then you simply iterate and, uh, and move to a larger slab size if necessary. Also, I do want to do some notes on, um, I do want to give some notes on spacing, on at spacing and uh, on particular dimensioning. And this wasn't as critical when we're doing beams, but I think it's particularly critical on uh, slabs. So a note on spacing. Okay, a note on spacing. Um, and maybe even just bar sizes. So as we work through this, uh, as we work through examples of uh, slab design, uh, we're going to have, uh, as we calculate spacing and things, we're going to end up with the, what I refer to as theoretical values, or theoretical slash ideal values. So you might end up with a space, so for example, say you run through some calculations and you determine that your necessary spacing is, oh, I don't know, um, 8.734 inches. So in other words, my math tells me that between two bars of known size, uh, ideally according to the math, I should, sp I should space those 8.734 inches apart. Anyone see a problem with that? Can I put that on a drawing? What do you think? Well, in case it's not too clear, if I say the spacing, it, regardless of what my math says, my math might tell me I'm good with a spacing of 8.734 inches, but that's not a good real world value. Um, anything that we're going to actually construct, if you, you know, you, I'm sure at some point you've all seen a construction site. Uh, this is not a super precise process. I mean, if you are, uh, if you're laying your steel to within an eighth of an inch, that's pretty high quality. That's pretty, uh, that's fairly accurate or fairly precise, I should say. So um, if you go and put 8.734 inches, there is no way that's actually going to be, that it, unless they're going to spend an ungodly amount of money 
uh, and probably make the slab cost, if you actually want it to be a space exactly 8.734 inches, you're probably multiplying the cost of your slab by a factor of 10 versus uh, what you would need to do, uh, need to pay under normal conditions because precision costs money. Uh, so instead, what we need to do is we need to round this to a reasonable value. And what I would recommend is, I would say probably to the nearest eighth inch, maybe even 16th or a, a quarter, depending on uh, your perspective, but just round to some nearest uh, value. And um, I don't want to, um, I want to be careful when rounding. So with spacing, think about this. The wider spaced bars are, the wider the spacing, the, the less effective area of steel per, per inch of width. So round, so basically a large spacing is going to be bad for strength while a narrow spacing is good for strength. All other things considered. So if, you, uh, if we want to round, well, if we're going to round, we need to make sure to round in the direction of safety. So even though the math might tell us we need a spacing of 8.734 inches, in this case, I would round down. I would round down and get a spacing of, oh, maybe I would put on the drawing 8 and, I don't know, um, 5 eighths of an inch, because that would be 8.65 inches. So maybe 8 and 5 eighths inch would be a good way to do that. And then bar sizes, rounding bar sizes. It is more, so think about bar sizes. It is more conservative to round up than round down. So if I determine that my bar diameter by the math is, let's say, oh, I don't know. Um, let's say the bar size is, let's say 15 sixteenths. Well, that is like uh, 7.5 over 8 inches. Uh, so remember, bar sizes are delineated in eighths of an inch. So a 15 over so even if the math tells me 15 over 16 would, would suffice, I would want to round up to the next largest bar size because when dealing with bar size, rounding up gives you additional strength while rounding down uh, gives you reduced strength. So we always want to, we can round and we need to round in our designs, but we always need to be careful to round in the direction of safety. So if I, if my math told me a bar size of uh, a bar diameter of 15 over 16 inch uh, would be adequate, I would uh, say, okay, well that's uh, 7.5 over eight inches. So I'm gonna round that up to eight over eight inches or simply a number eight bar, which has a diameter of one inch or eight eighths of an inch. So just a note on rounding. Okay, uh, notes on this, or any questions on this? Hope, again, fairly basic stuff, but it's just something I wanted to address. Um, we hadn't talked a lot about rounding previously, but it is uh, something, because it wasn't too critical with beam design, but with a slab design where you're, uh, where you're really trying to lay out bar sizes and spacing, I did want to just address that briefly. So a couple other things, uh, deflection limits. Uh, we could look at if you're if you're interested in deflection limits. We haven't really gotten to deflection yet, and I'm not going to be asking you to calculate it. But just for your edification, there are some deflection limits on one-way slabs, and that can be found in uh, Table uh, 24.2.2. 24.2.2. Now, uh, there's a, there's different ways to construct slabs as we've seen. We can have uh, one-way, oh, not one-way slabs. We can have, uh, there's different ways to construct one-way slabs or two-way slabs. You can have slabs that are simply supported. You can have cantilever slabs. You can have continuous slabs, etc. Now, the tricky thing about uh, continuous slabs 
four continuous slabs. The tricky thing about this is that um, uh, unless you want to use some, um, unless you want to use some uh, rather interesting and fun uh, indeterminate analysis techniques, which can be done, it can be difficult to analyze uh, a continuous slab because a, as a continuous structure, it is statically indeterminate. So, uh, so the simple, the simplest case would be simply supported slabs. There, you can calculate your maximum moment is just you know W L squared over eight or whatever, what have you. But for continuous slabs, uh, there are certain code provisions you can use to simplify the analysis. And this is table. Uh, it is its own can of worms. But you can find these coefficients in table 6.5.2. And I would like to go there and take a look at that. So let's take a look at table 6.5.2. So if you look at uh, table 6.5.2, this is only applicable to continuous one-way slabs. and beams as well. But you can only use these uh, only applicable to continuous slabs. Again, this is only applicable to continuous slabs. Uh, slabs where you have a, uh, again, as a reminder, a continuous slab is one that uh, spans multiple spans or continues through multiple spans. So you have a very long slab. And really, most of the slabs we design in buildings and bridges and such are continuous slabs. So you have a beam, a beam, a column, whatever it might be. And you have a, a, a single beam, or in this case, a single slab, continuing across multiple supports. And you'll notice that this table is defined in terms of uh, LN, where LN, again, is the clear distance between supports. So it's the clear distance between supports, and uh, it's defined. All of these are defined as ratios of W ultimate ln, um, ln squared, and it's some factor over, for example, 14, 11, 16, whatever it might be. Ln is as discussed here, and W ultimate is your ultimate factored load. So these are your ACI moment coefficients. Now, there are a, uh, a few ways to handle it. Now, there are a few requirements for this. Uh, you can't just always use these. There are certain requirements about when and where you can use these. So if you look at section 6.5.1, it says uh, you can calculate your ultimate moment this way. Um, however, there are some uh, limitations. And there's also uh, approximate shears in table 6.5.4. Uh, this 6.5.2 is for your approximate moments. And 6.5.4 is your approximate shears. For, again, for a continuous slab. Uh, approximate shears for a continuous slab. And um, for... But there are a few cases, you, you can't always use these. There are certain conditions that must apply before you can use these. Uh, so first of all, if you look at the, so let's look at the requirements in 6.5.1. So in order to use these, there's a few requirements. First, members are prismatic. That's fairly straightforward. If your slab starts at one thickness, but then it changes thickness along the course of the, uh, of its span, then in that case, that would not be a, that would not be a prismatic slab. Uh, loads are uniformly distributed. That's fairly uh, that's fairly uh, self-explanatory as well. I think if you only have load on one of your spans or a part of a span, that would not work, um, and so you wouldn't meet these uh, moment provisions. L is less than or equal to three D. This refers to loads. So your live load must be less than or equal to three times your dead load if you're going to use these ACI co coefficients. Uh, there have to be at least two spans, so it has to, has to actually be a continuous span in some in some way. And the longer of two adjacent spans does not exceed the shorter by 20%, by more than 20%. So in other words, if this slab is, let's say this span here is longer than this span here, well, this slab can't have a length greater than 1.2 times this length 
here. So, and that, and those are the provisions for the ACI uh, moment coefficients. Okay. Any questions on that? I know this uh, may be a little bit difficult to wrap your head around, but we will be working through some examples and we will uh, hopefully see how to apply this in a manner that actually makes sense when we bring all this together. And um, one other thing, we haven't talked about beam shear yet, and we will get to that uh, later after, that's actually our next unit after uh, slab design, our one-way slab design. But uh, for, our, uh, for our, our shear, for our slabs here, we do need to consider uh, shear strength. And in particular, concrete shear strength. Now, when you use uh, beams, there is, uh, or there are uh, things you can apply to beams that will increase their shear strength, in particular stirrups, uh, or transverse reinforcement it's referred to as, and those can enhance uh, shear strength. But uh, for slabs, we're not going to have to deal with uh, shear reinforcement, but we do need to make sure our slab is thick enough to have a, uh, our necessary uh, shear strength required in the slab. So, in other words, we need to use a uh, equation 22.5.5.1, or an equation from that table, I should say. And this governing equation is Vc is equal to 2 times lambda uh, times the square root of f prime c bw d. So just like we've seen before, most of our concrete properties are defined in terms of our guiding overall property, our central one property rule of them all, which is f prime c. So what this states is this is the uh, this is the nominal uh, shear strength of the concrete in a slab. And normally there's all the, the reason we use this V sub C is that for beams, We'll all, uh, for beams, we'll also add transverse reinforcement. When we're doing beams, we'll add transverse reinforcement, which means you have your main rebar going this way and this way, but then you'll also have some stirrups spaced a certain, at certain even distances in order to carry uh, shear load. Now, a slab, it's, a slabs generally aren't thick enough to make uh, stirrups possible, so we have to rely on, so when you do have stirrups, you have a VS, a shear capacity of steel. But uh, with, again, with um, slabs, we're not going to have stirrups, so we don't have this VS uh, shear capacity of steel. All we need to make sure instead that our uh, shear, uh, that our ultimate shear does not ex exceed our nominal concrete shear capacity times some, uh, times some, um, uh, strength reduction factor. Okay, so that's kind of a grab bag of assorted things that we'll need to use as we uh, work through examples of uh, slab design.